Hello. Welcome once again to Off the Shelf Books on Tour. Bring you a book today that is, I don't want to use trite words, it's fascinating, it's historical, it's adventurous, it's amazing. My guest is Marina Dutzman Kirsch. Kirsch. Kirsch, thank you. Who has encapsulated 75 years of memory, history, and romance in a book, Flight of Remembrance. Welcome. Thank you. Stuffed full. I had such a hard time writing my notes because there's so many fascinating things that come through. So why don't you start off with, the? you wrote the first paragraph the day the Berlin Wall came down. Yes, that's, that's true. It's a long journey. It is a long journey, but my, my parents' journey was even longer. It actually began in 1919 when my father was born, in 1921 when my mother was born. It spanned the years between World War I and World War II, but then, of course, all of the years of World War II, and my book also covers six post-war years, up until 1951 when we immigrated to this country. I was born en route from it's Germany bizarre. to the USA. So I kind of end the story there in the, the epilogue. My father was a Latvian, Latvian aeronautical engineering student. He had this overarching dream and goal for his life, which was a career in aeronautical engineering. And he maintained that dream all his life. When the family was forced to flee Latvia in 1939, just in advance of the Soviet occupation, he gave that up, not knowing what would happen on the other end. So from the time the family left the port city of Riga, Latvia, on a ship bound for Germany, they had no idea where they were going to be sent, and they were people without a country, people without a home, people without a national identity. They did not know where the regime would resettle them. And for my father and my grandfather both, it must have been a very unsettling time, not knowing would they be immediately drafted once they arrived. Now, my grandfather had been a military man all his life, and in fact served in the Tsarist Russian army in World War I, ironically was taken prisoner of war by Germany, spent his time in a, in a German prisoner of war camp, but then was allowed to stay in Germany and work in German industry for a time. During that time, he met my grandmother, a woman who had been born and raised in the Rhineland by nuns, I might add, which is how she learned the beautiful needlework that I'm wearing. They married, they had my father there, but by the time Dad was two years old, my grandfather, very homesick for his homeland of Latvia, decided to go back. By that time, Latvia was independent. It hadn't been for a long time. So the family returned to Latvia, and my father lived there from age two until age 20, at which time they were forced to flee in advance of the Soviet takeover. My grandfather would have definitely been executed. He was a military man. Um, practically all his life. Tsarist Russian army, then the Free Republic of Latvia in the army as a major, working in a munitions laboratory on the Baltic coast of the Baltic Sea, and he was an outspoken anti-communist. He would have definitely fallen under the new communist regime and been one of the casualties but after the advance. But his education and his scientific knowledge truly saved him time yes. and time and time again. Time and time again. And I believe my grandfather and also my mother's mother were the catalysts who kept the family alive. She was something else. Uh, was she something else? <laughs> my grandmother Gertrude, yes, God she was an her. amazing woman. Very courageous. In fact, to the point of being foolhardy, if we think about it now. But it worked. But it worked. And she was so confident that she could pull it off and she did I think without that confidence on my grandmother's part neither my mother nor my father would have survived mm -hmm. and in my book presentations I don't talk much about the time period between my parents wedding 
in late 1944 and November of 1945 when my fa father finally left the prisoner of war camp he was in under very exciting circumstances, I might add. And the reason I don't talk about that is my presentations would have to be a lot longer <laughs> because the sequence of synchronistic events mm -hmm. that occurred. But she had to have courage yes, to pull it off. Yes, and a lot of them were due to my grandmother's fortitude, courage, ingenuity, mm -hmm. creativity, and just amazing boldness. She was a woman who in my opinion, was the equal of any man of her day. Better than. Perhaps better than. <laughs> but when you think about it, women in those times, and also women here in the U.S., were forced to take over the roles of men. So what had previously been the prerogative of men, the women were then doing it. They needed to make decisions. They needed to be bold and forthright and courageous and do all of the things that the men were not around to take care of. And still stay mama, yes, wife, sister, she had a close family. And they did, through all the movements, all the comings and goings, they stuck together. They supported one another. They, That's right. They didn't lose one another. That, that family and faith was, I would say, most. Yes, family and faith, very, very important in mm -hmm. my family's story. And getting back to my maternal grandmother, Gertrude, for a moment, she also was a very gifted soprano. She had a beautiful voice, and she also taught piano. So she was very musically inclined, which is, is another part of the story that I find fascinating because she started her singing career in Poland during World War I or possibly even just before World War I. Mm -hmm. But that was derailed because of World War I. And then, of course, derailed again because of World War II. But she, too, after the war was over and she immigrated to the U.S. in 1953, she actually held some solo recitals Good for her. where she sang. Good and for her. it was beautiful. Now, so was her she dream the lady that made the beautiful dress? No. No. That's okay. the other grandmother. So, who had her own set of skills and, and mm -hmm. talents. Uh, she was a very, very gifted needlewoman, had learned from nuns in the Rhineland growing up. And she created a lot of items that we still have in our family collection. Now that I found fascinating in the book, along with keeping family and faith. They never lost their tangibles. That Gatti grandmother showed up one day with furniture and glassware yes. and dishes. That was my mother's mother. That's, a, that's astounding, given it wasn't a U-Haul truck. They did lose a lot of things, but on my father's side of the family, they lost less of importance because my, my grandmother Maria, who made this dress, was not only a master packer, but she had a sense of what was important to her in her life what constituted her sense of identity and obviously family was number one. The, the collection of family photographs was probably number two. Also letters and other memorabilia. We have items from my grandfather's military career going all the way back to Tsarist Russia. All of those have been preserved and Which you found documents. invaluable and allowed you to be so specific. Yes. And, and you found something on the net. Uh, about my grandfather's work during World War II, my, and here I am, I'm talking a lot about my grandparents, but frankly, it's my parents' story, and yet They're my parents my, my parents are the result of my grandparents' diligence and their hard work and their creativity in their own lives. But yes, my grandfather, because of his incredible skills, he was drafted into the German army in 1942. They made him a major right away because he had been a major in Latvia when he worked at the munitions laboratory. And he was sent to work with Vanna von Braun, the rocket scientist, at a place called Peenemünde on the island of Usedom in, in the Baltic Sea. Now that is where the V-1 and V-2 rockets were developed, and my grandfather was sent there specifically, and it was an assignment, it was not a choice. He was sent there specifically to train for V-2 rocket inspection. 
He later was sent after the facility at Pinamunda was bombed by the Allies in August of 1943. He was sent to the Hartz Mountain area of Germany, which was in, in the heart of Germany that had not yet seen any Allied bombing. There was an underground top secret installation there called Mittelwerk, where the V1 and the V2 were mass produced. From February of 1944 until April of 1945, at which time the Allies were at the gates and everyone was ordered to evacuate, he was, he was there working as a chief inspector of the V2 rockets. But he didn't just inspect when he saw munitions being prepared to be repacked and they blew up and killed people, he invented a way to have it almost done robotically. Yes, that so was no, in Latvia, so though. So nobody's life was it. But he carried, he used his education under duress in circumstances which we can't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. He always made sure that it was as beneficial to the people who were in like circumstances yes. as those who were telling him what to do, which is yes, amazing. Yes, exactly. Well, and also, one of the great surprises to me came in 2000, late 2010, when I, I thought I was done with my book, I was ready to publish, and I thought, let me just Google my grandfather's name, because... I was basically just writing a family story for other people to appreciate and enjoy, and I hadn't really done a lot of research. And you didn't I had have to, you had it all in house. I had a well, I had a family history from my parents that they wrote and gave to all of us children and How grandchildren cool. in 1993. It's a book thicker than no, it's not thicker than this one, but it, it approximates. But what a that. gift! And they recorded our story from way back further in time, the 1800s, which go back to Russia on both sides of my family. But thanks to that book, I was able to have the skeleton already, the backbone of this book that I wrote was already there. And with both of my parents still alive, I could get further information from them. But what I didn't have, the, the missing component, was my grandfather's part in the war. I knew he was chief inspector of the V2. I thought he worked in an office somewhere, ivory tower conditions. Frontline could not have been more different. He worked at this top secret installation that also had a camp, a labor camp, a notorious labor camp right outside the gates. There were inmates who worked in the underground installation, about a third of whom died during the roughly year and a half that, that they were working there. Many of them early on, before my grandfather arrived, were put to work expanding the, the underground network of tunnels. I visited there in 2011, just before my book was published, and I donated some documents from my grand, grandfather. And I was able to tour some of those tunnels. Is that where he it built the house out of storage crates? No, that was in Bavaria, <laughs> post-war. Post, yeah, he was Three so imaginative. Three POW plans. Yes. So this <clears> was this, where they were and they had, you know, minimal housing, sleeping on the ground in tents, and he took the crates that delivered this godforsaken machinery, and he made what we see now as little houses. Yes, <laughs> and it was a charming little house. The front porch and all. He even got an additional crate and put a front porch mm. on it. It was, it was very cozy, I might add, but and he, very small, but it, he it never housed gave the family. to the Depression of what was happening, and the kids had to see that. They had to learn that work ethic. Or your father would never, he was, what would you say, 75% as smart as your grandfather? Possibly. Pushing 80? Yes. And in his life, because he was in POW camps as well. Yes, he was. A, a worse one than my mm -hmm. grandfather, a under pot, worse conditions. A pot more often than they were together. But they never gave up. Yes, and I really feel that that's a key, not only to my parents' survival, but also for what our future holds. It's largely our attitude, what we make of the circumstances we're handed, because in most cases we don't have a choice in, in those circumstances. And the set of circumstances that my grandparents and my parents were handed were 
extremely difficult. When you think about the fact that allied veterans have been through a lot, but they left a secure homeland to go and fight overseas, they knowing that their family to. at home was probably okay. Mm -hmm. When you think about people, not only in Germany, but all of Europe, whose loved ones were also on the front lines, who had to flee their homes. And then they who, got a message that said their home was no more. It had been blown up. Yes. It's all gone. Yeah, the background of my book shows the, the rubble of the, the ruined Dutzmann family home in Berlin. And on both sides of my family, the, the homes were destroyed. My mother's home was also destroyed in stages. Mm -hmm. The top floor, then the next floor, then the pipes were broken, water was flowing into the apartment. And at that point, she and my grandmother decided we can no longer sleep here. They were forced to stay in Berlin, forced to continue working there, until a certain point, but they moved into a storage area that they rented outside the city, and they slept there amongst the few possessions they to could work salvage. With what they had, it. Um, I think any high school senior or junior or freshman should read it. Um, when I was in school, I did not read about the Korean War. When my children were in school, they did not read about the Vietnam War. And I think this is very telling of what is not in the history books in school. Yes, I would agree. Also, from the many book presentations I've given, I'm finding that there is still an awful lot of healing from World War II that needs to take place. And it's not only among the children of people who were in Europe or people who were in Europe. Many of them alive today were children during the war and they arrive at many of my presentations. I always make sure that their stories are shared. I also put them on my Facebook page when I can. But in addition, there are all the allied veterans sharing their stories, and I make sure to always ask if there are veterans present and, and to acknowledge them. But there's a lot of healing still. Right, but this would be a part of that healing Yes. to see the other side. Exactly. They weren't just soldiers with a gun. They were people, just like you and I, fighting and doing the best they could with the circumstances of their life. I included a little icon, a little illustration above my title, above the word of. Mm -hmm. It's actually of a pre-World War II Latvian glider that my father constructed in high school. with a group of young men. He was still in high school, and he was the first one to volunteer to fly it. The f actual photograph is also in the book of him flying Wonderful it. Wonderful photograph, he was, thank you. He knew how to fly it. He had been studying gliders for years and building model gliders. This was his first full-time glider, but he was confident he could fly it, and he did. But now, he didn't glider, go to the store and buy. He scavenged, no. he found, yes. he manufactured, he made. The group of young men, including my father, that constructed that were part of the Izargs, which was the closest thing that Latvia had to a National Guard between the two world wars. When the Soviets came, it was completely disbanded and never started up again. But that little glider symbolizes two things. My father's overarching goal in life, aeronautical engineering all his light, life, right up until his death at age 94, was his passion. And after retirement, he taught hundreds of kids here, uh, in, primarily in the Granite State. Model rocketry, uh, the principles of aviation. He decided to share his knowledge with NASA. young people. He had conversations with NASA. Yes. And he was involved with Krista McAuliffe, which is very special to all of us. Well, my father, after we immigrated to the U.S. and after we were naturalized as citizens, he was hired by the Chrysler Missile and Space Division near Detroit. And there he headed the design team that designed components of the Saturn V and the Saturn 1B rockets. And those components were later used successfully in all of the Apollo moon missions. So what is totally amazing to me is that goal in life, it not only was not derailed by war and tragedy and trauma and and upheaval, but it actually expanded to encompass the U.S. space program. It was faith. 
Now, when you came, I thought it was interesting. You had to be sponsored, or they had to be sponsored. Yes. I think you weren't here yet. Was it a Lutheran community? No. No. It was actually Church of the Brethren. Okay. And they were in Indiana? Indiana. A little town called Wakarusa, which means knee-deep in mud. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Potawatomi Indian word. And they word. could get off the plane and say, Ben, they had done that. <laughs> mm -hmm. They got off the plane in New York City, and... My parents' first thought was one of absolute dismay. They arrived in a city that was so crowded, so noisy, exhaust fumes, so many people, and they thought, is all of the U.S. like this? Right. I'm sure they had a lot of second and thoughts. And they had to stand in line for hours, and they had to be checked in, and they had to be healthy enough to leave together. Which one? What, there was three of you by No, four of you Four by of then. us by then. <clears throat> so... Um, that those had to be very trying times, but how great that an American community was there to welcome them. Yes. And they were furnished the house as best they could. Correct. And supplied all that they needed that first couple of weeks. And they needed for nothing when they could actually get here and go, Wow. And they got the full scope of they what They provided America. everything for us. And at the last minute when let me explain that on December 18th of 1951, three people left Germany where they were living in Bavaria. My father, my mother, my older brother Ingo. And they traveled across this incredibly rubble-strewn country. Remember that everything was destroyed. The infrastructure just wasn't there. In order to get from there to Zurich, Switzerland, that they were supposed to fly from to get to the U.S., they had to travel by car, by, bu by bus, by train, and by air to get there. And your mother was pregnant. My mother was eight months pregnant. <laughs> Very. And all of northern Europe was covered with a dense fog. When they arrived in Zurich, they found out that their flight would be delayed until the following morning. Well, that night my mother went into labor, and the next morning I was born. I completely disrupted my family's plan to immigrate to the new world by entering the old world when I did. They had to then raise funds for my plane, flip, my plane fare. And that happened thanks to the very kind people of Wakarusa, Indiana, including Pastor Stanley Biddinger and his wife, Vivian. Thank you, folks. <laughs> you made our American dream possible. And they are still alive. Thank God. But no they live in Texas. What the world threw at them, their faith and their belief, they just kept on plugging. Yes. And there was somebody there, an angel. There were nine people meeting us at the train station when we arrived in Wakarusa. They guided the Summers family, the Nussbaum family. They are the ones that, that sponsored my family members to come. Uh, the Nussbaum family sponsored my maternal grandmother. My uh, immediate family was sponsored by the Summers, but they were deemed not able to provide for our entire family if something happened to my father. Most people here in the U.S. have no idea the risk that people in this country took to sponsor others to come over. Had something happened to my father so that he couldn't work, they would have been responsible for our entire financial well-being. Mm -hmm. This was an immense risk. What happened then is the entire community, the Church of the Brethren in Wakarusa, spearheaded by Pastor Stanley Biddinger and his wife Vivian, decided they would be the ones to collectively Take sponsor us. All. Yes. Right. Now, the other people that were lucky enough to emigrate, they are as endeared to the people that sponsored them. It's a lifelong appreciation. It's it not a thank you note with a stamp on it. You, how wonderful as an American to know that there's people here who cared that much to put their lives on the line for strength. Exactly. And people who had just been enemies in World War II a short time before. I might also add that the story <laughs> of our sponsors inspired me so much Another that I dedicated my book to them as well as we to my We only parents. have two minutes. You had this edited three, four, five, six, seven times. How big is your research library, and are you going to do it again? 
Another book, you mean? Yeah. Right now, I have not come across another topic that I'm equally passionate about, and I'm finding the process of talking mm. about my book, sharing my family's story, is having such a wonderful effect on a lot of people. Good. It's educational, but it's also a healing process. And my, what I found, again, getting back to that little symbol of the glider, is that I gained a higher perspective of World War II through the retelling of my family's story. And I think people would learn that. That's why I say it. it's, you haven't covered half of my notes. <laughs> it, it is so full of firsthand good information. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It was a long journey. You did a really good job. And a lot of authors are terrified of this the marketing, the speaking publicly, and apparently it works for you. So your book will go even further and you will continue to carry on that gift that your parents and their parents gave them. Well, I'm trying to also share the gift of public speaking. I'm the president of a Toastmasters International Club in Exeter, New Hampshire, and we have people who are going through the process of learning public speaking and leadership skills through that organization. It's fun, isn't it? It is a I lot of fun. I don't know why people are afraid. It's got to be a confidence thing. I think I overcame it when I became passionate enough about something that I knew it wasn't about me. It was about sharing what I knew, what I had experienced, what my family had experienced. If you don't learn from history, you're destined to repeat it. Yes. And the older I get, the more I realize it's my responsibility to teach those who are coming up what it's taken me so long to learn. And thank you, God, most of the time they're receptive. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Veronica, Please for let us me. know how it's being received if young people are reading it and if you're hearing from them, because that, that would tickle yes. me. Yes. In fact, let me tell you one brief thing. We reestablished a connection with a lost branch of our family because of my book. Excellent. A woman living in Berlin. She is a cousin of my father's from Latvia. They fled in 1944. We lost contact with that part of the family. But she had been looking for our family, any information, Googling our names. When she came across my book, she bought it, and then she knew that we are related, Excellent. contacted me via email. We now have information about that branch of our family. Well, there's your next book. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Nice. Well done. Excellent, excellent read. Very, I'm so glad I had the opportunity. Thank and you. And my website is www.kirschstonebooks.com. Good job. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. Bye.